Well, good morning, church. So good to see you on Easter morning as the people of God come to celebrate. This is the greatest celebration that one who is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ can partake in. I would dare say to you, far greater than any sports championship you could ever celebrate. Far greater than any Mardi Gras parade you could ever celebrate. Far greater even than Christmas is Easter. Christmas is the beginning. Easter is the culmination of the purpose for our Savior coming to planet Earth. This morning we're in Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12, and we're talking about Easter, a day of celebration. Celebration. Many of you are wearing new clothes today. Those clothes are a symbol of a new life, something Christ has done in you. And externally, it became tradition to dress up at Easter as a symbol of the dressing up God's already done on the inside. Amen? Amen. Well, through the resurrection, our Lord tells us that he brings light to replace the darkness. It is in this event we know as Easter that he seeks to have a personal relationship with us. He seeks to know us intimately and to allow us to know him intimately. And in that experience, we receive resurrection power in our lives. Easter is, in fact, the greatest celebration we can experience. I would remind you that the Christian faith is based 100% on the resurrection. If the resurrection is false, if it did not happen, if Christ did not beat death in the grave, then you may as well be somewhere else this morning. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes to the Corinthian church, for if the dead did not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. So what is Paul saying? If in fact the account that the word of God gives us, that this man Jesus, son of God, came and lived a perfect life for three and a half years on planet earth and then gave himself as a sacrifice for my sin, nailing my sin that I'm guilty of to the cross, was buried and then beat death in the grave, then everything we do is a joke. It's a waste of time. But the Bible tells us Jesus did in fact rise. And in fact, his life, his death, burial, and resurrection is one of the most recorded in all of human history. And those who put their faith in him, who trust him, will be released from darkness and misery, and the penalty of their sin. Because of the Easter event, we have the most encouraging, empowering word that we can share with anyone. We live in a time where our world is struggling as much as I've seen it struggle in my lifetime. Suicide rates among all age groups are higher than they have ever been. People are struggling to cope. People are struggling to get by. People are struggling with the meaning of life. And I'm telling you, my friends, you and I have the answer that they need. Because Jesus will bring them hope. He will bring them light. Because even though we live in a dark, gloomy, evil world, Christ brings into our lives light and hope and goodness. And that's what we all need. In Luke chapter 21, Jesus is instructing his disciples about what they should be looking for when the times are drawing near. He said, now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Listen, some of you get caught up in all of this prophecy stuff and, and you're all concerned with 
what country's doing what and what the European Union's doing and, and what else is going on. Listen to me very carefully. The sign of the times is simply this. Your redemption is near. He's going to complete the work that he started in you. He's going to complete you, taking you to heaven, taking you to that perfect place that he designed for people that he would perfect for all of eternity. It is my hope and prayer this morning that as you sit here on Easter Sunday morning, you have in fact asked Christ to come into your life and be the Lord and Savior of your life, acknowledging in humility your sin and asking him to forgive you of that sin and to be the head of your life. That's what it means to be a born-again believer. Jesus is in charge. Now, we live in probably the most selfish generation that has ever existed on planet Earth. And this is why so many are struggling. The talking heads are more than happy to write the obituary of the church of Jesus Christ. But look around. This is the first service. By the way, this is the lightly attended service. Every church in this parish this morning looks just like this one. Most every church across America this morning looks just like this one. Those who have no hope have been writing the obituary of the church of Jesus Christ since the beginning of time because they want misery to enjoy misery. But as the people of God, we know better. So this morning, let's look at this passage together. Beginning in verse 1. The first thing I want you to see, without Christ, we walk in death and darkness. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid, they bowed their faces to the earth. And they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? The scene is early in the morning. This is why we worship on Sunday. We worship on Sunday because the Lord Jesus Christ conquered our sin, death, and hell on Sunday morning. And that's why the Christian church celebrates on Sunday. And I know our brothers and sisters over at the Seventh-day Adventist Church still worship on the Sabbath, and that's all right. That's their call, their conviction. Nothing wrong with that. But that's legalism. Don't get caught up in legalism. Celebrate what Christ has done in your life, my friend. That's why we come together on Sunday mornings. That's why we don't plan other things on Sunday mornings. It's because the people of God come together to separate, to, to celebrate what the Son of God has done in their life. He was crucified for us, buried, and on the third day got up. Conquering all that was ever evil, brought into this world. We know that Mary Magdalene was there early in the morning, so was Joanna, Mary the mother of Jesus. And I love that phrase, we tend to forget about it, and other women with them. There were several women there. Is it interesting to you that the very first ones to proclaim the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ were in fact women? And I would say to you, while I'm so thrilled to pastor a church with so many strong men, and I think a church needs strong men to lead their families, and I praise God for every one of you that lead your family. The reality is we have a church full of strong women, too. Amen? Yeah. And many of them are leading their families where their men won't step up. Many of them are leading in ministry where the men won't step up. And so our Lord always acknowledged the women that were around him. 
this early in the morning, still dark, is important. Because darkness is a symbol of everything that is wrong. It is a symbol of sin. It is a symbol of evil. It is a symbol of death. Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 59 verse 2, but your iniquities have separated you from God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. And then verse 9 and 10 of that same chapter, therefore justice is far from us, nor does righteousness overtake us. We look for light, but there is darkness, for brightness, but, there, but we walk in darkness blackness we grope for the wall like the blind and we grope as if we had no eyes we stumble at noonday as if it were twilight we are as dead as men in desolate places before Christ comes into one's life that life is aimless it has no purpose it has no destination worthy of discussion but once Christ comes into your life, he gives you purpose. He gives you value. He gives you a destination of purpose. He gives you a reason to live. He gives you a reason to avoid suicide. He gives you a reason to avoid living in despair. It is a life filled with hope, my friends. It may have been a very beautiful day on the day they crucified our Lord. But it was also a day of loss a day of grief, a day of despair. All of these followers had bet their entire lives on this man Jesus, and now he's dead. It's hard for you and me to comprehend that. I have learned over the years that if you're having surgery, it's minor surgery, but if I'm having surgery, it's major surgery. And so it's hard for us all of this time separated later to imagine the moment that they're engaged in here. Their hopes and dreams are dashed. But I bet you've heard the saying, it's always darkest before the dawn. At least if you've ever hunted. Maybe that's how you feel today. We've been through COVID, we've been through a hurricane, many of our houses are still destroyed, insurance companies uh, have not done the right thing by and large. I, I gotta tell you, I just make you feel better if, if, if I'm right at all. I think God has a special place in hell for insurance executives just saying, <laughs> amen. That gives you an idea of how many houses are still struggling. We've been through a lot on planet Earth, but we must remember our hope is not in planet Earth. These things are temporal, they're temporary. Our hope is in Christ Jesus, and we live for eternity. Sin will lead you in spiritual darkness until it eventually leads you to a spiritual death. John chapter eight, verse 12, Jesus declared, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. When you seek Jesus, he will come to you. Uh, we, we often say when we come to Christ, I, I found Jesus. No, you didn't find him. He wasn't lost. He's been there all along, but you weren't looking. You weren't paying attention. I've noticed as I get a little older, and it really aggravates me because my wife is more right these days, I, I, I can look at something and not see it sometimes. And none of the women, amen. <laughs> Amazing. I can, look, I can look right at it. Go back later and see it in the same place. So I want you to know this morning, Jesus is there. You're just not seeing it. You've got to look with interest. And when you see him, he will reveal to you your imperfection, your need for him. The fact that you are a sinner, even though society and culture tells you there's no such thing. He will reveal to you a conviction in your heart and your mind 
for the things you have done and the way you have lived and a need to draw into holiness with him and to allow him to direct your path. Allow him to guide your life. And I'm telling you this morning, you desperately need that. Every human being desperately needs that. Louis Pascal, the great research scientist, said that every human being has a God-shaped void inside of them that only God can fill. Nothing else can fill that void. Colossians 1, the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Colossae, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood and forgiveness of sins. I'm telling you this morning that you don't have to live in despair and hopelessness. When you come to Christ, He gives you the power to live above that existence. We are forgiven by the blood he shared for us on Calvary. Amen. That blood, a sacrifice for all of our sin, for all eternity. You know, you should have died for your sin. You're guilty of your sin. You should have been put on a cross for your sin. You should have been executed for your sin. But instead, Jesus took your place. Amen? Amen? Yeah. And because he took your place, you don't have to pay the price for that sin. He paid it for you. The Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. That means he did it for me and you. That he might bring us to God. Why did he do it? There's a reason that you might have a relationship with holy God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. I can tell you from personal experience, you may think you're alive this morning, but until the Holy Spirit of God is living inside of you, you have no idea what being alive is. I love that verse we all know, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world, that's everybody, by the way, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, I, I want to try to get you to do something this morning that I learned as a teenager and I still do it and I love to do it. Personalize the word of God. Personalize it. For God so loved me that he gave his only begotten son, that if I would believe in him, I would not perish but have everlasting life. Personalize the word of God. It is God's love story written to you, my friend. Make it personal. See what God is saying to you. When these women get to the tomb, they find it open and they're confused. They're in the presence of two angels, and the Word of God said they bowed their heads in fear. Listen, I get so tired of Christians telling me they had an encounter with the angel, and it was beautiful and warm and fuzzy, and it glowed in the dark. Listen to me. You need to read your Bible. Angels are scary, hideous-looking creatures. Read the description of angels. And you'll not find one place where an angel appears that they're not terrified, shaking in their boots. Y'all all right? You've been watching too many movies. And the good angels, always sweet. God has warring angels. Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah. And there's no doubt in my mind these may very well be two of his warring angels who were standing watch over our Savior as he lay in that tomb. And the angels asked them a very important question. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Now that's a loaded statement. What they're saying is the Lord told you he was going to beat death. The Lord told you he would resurrect. The Lord told you this was temporary. The Lord told you this had to happen. None of you guys can believe it. Listen, it shouldn't rock your world that your family member or buddy at work can't believe in the resurrection. The people who walked with Jesus had trouble believing. 
They were far closer to it than we have been. And they're struggling. Now, I love that statement because I think there's also a spiritual teaching there because it's one of the greatest problems we have in the world. We always have had. We seek life where there is death. We seek life in alcohol and drugs and activities that take us down horrible paths. We seek life in ugly, dirty places, and we wonder why we don't find life. Listen to me. Seek life where there is life. The Lord Jesus wants to bring you life. He wants to save you from your sins, not just for eternity, but for what they would do to you now, here on planet Earth. But modern-day Christians don't want to hear much of that. We just want to know we have a ticket, right? Without Jesus, you're dead in your sin, living in a life of darkness. Second thing I want you to see is the resurrection is a message of life. Verses 6 through 8. He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. <laughs> Boy, isn't that human? Oh, oh, yeah, he did tell us that, didn't he? Oh, my goodness. Is that what's happening? And so these women who come to anoint the Lord, it was common practice, and, and they are distraught because they can't find him. The angels have to give them the good news of the gospel story that he has risen. We see him predict this in Luke chapter 9. As we've gone through Luke's gospel, he teaches it several times. And when the women recall his words and they see the empty tomb, it all made sense. It confirmed for them the resurrection. Death had, in fact, been conquered. Despair was turned to hope. Darkness is replaced in light. Bad is pushed out with goodness. I am always amazed as long as the Lord has let me live on planet Earth, that these people who want to do away with the Bible, they want to do away with that book, they want to do away with religion, they want to do away with all that garbage. I mean, after all, all it does is call people to live a better, happy life. Need to get rid of that. Can't have people living in joy. Can't have people living a better life. Can't have people turning around doing good instead of evil. Get rid of that. It's really very simple, guys. They want to replace good with evil, but the power of God has replaced evil with good. Thirdly, the resurrection is good news. It's good news. Look at verse 9. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to the rest. they telling everybody that would listen. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. The very men that were in charge of the story didn't believe the story. Maybe these women are just hysterical. Maybe they're just telling wives' tales. They discounted what they said. Now, these women returned in excitement. Every time I go home to my hometown, I love to drive by the police station. And there's a reason. What is now the police station in my hometown was a little church at one point in time. And that's the little church where I gave my life to Jesus. And I remember I always pay attention to the distance because it so radically affected my life. I ran all the way home that day. I was so excited. I couldn't wait to tell somebody what Jesus had done for me. This poor little backwards kid from the wrong side of the tracks. How Jesus had just transformed my life into something with meaning and purpose. I was so excited. And I went immediately next door to my best friend. And I told him, I'd just gotten saved. And I'll never forget. He said, saved from what? <laughs> the lost world's ready to throw cold water on your party. 
But when it's really sad, it's when those who ought to be celebrating with you are dumping cold water on your party. So here are these women on fire for Jesus with a story of the gospel telling everybody to listen and the disciples got ice water waiting on them. I'll never forget well-meaning believers telling me when I was new in Christ, you, you just take it easy. It'll all settle down for you. I pray to God it never settles down. That's what's wrong with the modern church. Too many of us don't settle down. It's not exciting anymore. It's not real anymore. It's like an old bedtime story. Let me tell you something. If Jesus is not real for you, you better evaluate if anything real ever happened. Instead of trying to Convince yourself that being in religion will do something for you. Hmm. Their death march was transformed into a march for life. Excited. Excited. Celebrating. The Gospel of John tells us that Mary Magdalene ran to tell Peter and the others. Yeah. Excited about it. They told the disciples their story, and they thought they were just hysterical women. Hmm. Uh, before you're too critical, I'll guarantee you there's some things written in the Word of God that you struggle with. I talk to people all the time with very legitimate questions. Brother Steve, what about this? What about that? What happened here? How, why did this take place? What went on? I talk to people all the time. It's good to question. It's good to challenge because I believe the Word of God is the Word of God and I believe as you challenge it, it will reveal itself to you and make itself more real for you than it ever has. Don't fall into this idea that trusting Christ is blind and stupid. It's never been that. That's what people who want to kill the book want to tell you. And if you get off into all that stuff, you'll get off into the weeds and get bogged down in a life of depression and nothing will have hope for you. It'll all be hopelessness. They had trouble believing. You're going to have trouble believing sometimes too. And that's where faith comes in. Is Jesus who he said he was. The disciples are rejecting the resurrection, guys. They don't believe it. Ah, it probably didn't happen. If we're not careful, we've heard the story so many times that we start rejecting it. Can I tell you the greatest evidence that Christ is real is a changed life? You can argue science. You can argue archaeology. You can argue all of the academic disciplines until you're blue in the face. But you can't argue with a changed life. You just can't. And that's what the Apostle Paul meant when he wrote to the Corinthian church. And he said, God gives us his spirit as a guarantee. You know what that means? Is that Christ puts his Holy Spirit inside of you. And here's what I have learned for a fact. If an individual has the Holy Spirit inside of them, you will never convince them God's not real. And if they don't have it, you'll never convince them God's real. Because it is the deposit for his children to let them know that he's real, that this deal is real, that it's not just a storybook. It's genuine. Romans 10, 9 tells us that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, what did the Word of God say? If you join a particular church, you will be saved. If you ascribe to these certain things, you will be saved. What he says is, if you can believe Jesus is who he said he is, in your heart and in your mind, and you can confess him that he is your Lord, you shall be saved. That's what he says. Easter morning brings good news to a world filled with darkness, my friends. 
We have that good news. Don't be afraid to share it. And then the last thing this morning, you must experience him for yourself. Verse 12. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb. And stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves. And he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Best statement I've ever heard is God has no grandchildren. He only has children. So your daddy or your granddaddy might have been a preacher. Your mama might have led the missions organization. Your great-great-granddaddy might have founded a church. None of that means anything for you other than you had some godly people in your family tree. But for you, it's got to be personal. It's not enough. Your relationship with holy God has to be uniquely yours. You can't ride the coattails of anyone else. And I got to tell you, our church here is no different than any other church I've ever pastored. I meet more people in this town that I've never seen before in my life. Hey, I'm a member of your church. You are? Yeah. Yeah, my granddaddy was a deacon there for 40 years, sat on the back row, third chair on the left next to my grandma, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. And then they start telling me what we ought to do. <laughs> I'm sad to tell them that that's wonderful. Grandpa and Grandma were here. But it's got to be yours. You've got to own your relationship with Jesus. Look at John 20, starting in verse 2. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, the apostle, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter. That's how you know Peter was probably a fat boy. <laughs> and came to the tomb first and he, stooping down, looked in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him, went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloth lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. See, we all hear the good news of the resurrection, but the reality is the life-changing experience that you have to have to be a child of God has to be yours and yours only. Peter and John didn't believe it. They had to go see it for themselves. And Peter had to go inside. He had to observe. He had to look at it. I challenge you to do that. Don't be afraid. C.S. Lewis, one of the greatest academic minds of the last generation, acknowledged and revered in all academic circles, set out to prove religion to be fake and came to Christ. And then in our own modern day, there are actually many. But Lee Strobel, we've had here in our own church, who set out to prove that it was all a bunch of wives' tales, that it was all fake, ended up coming to Christ. So I challenge you to explore your own experience. Don't be afraid to ask the questions. Don't be afraid to ask why this happened or that happened. Don't be afraid to ask, what does this mean? Because my friends, if you are honest in your intellectual pursuit, you will come to a place where you will acknowledge Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now, I'm not naive. I'm so happy you're here today. But a lot of you are here today, unlike Father's Day. Because when you said, Mama, what you want? She said, I want you to go to church with me. And that's the only reason you're here. Some of you are here because you live in the South, and going to church on Easter is what you do. I'm glad you're here. And for whatever reason you're here today, I challenge you to explore the question. Is this man Jesus the real deal? And if he is, 
Will you trust him with your life? Will you go out of here today with a celebration? You know, we love to celebrate birthdays, don't we? Yeah. Do you know that January the 5th is my spiritual birthday? Do you know your spiritual birthday? Do you know the day that you were born in Christ? Do you know the day that he came in and radically saved your soul and changed the direction of your life? Do you have a clue of that moment? Because I'm telling you, my friends, I, I don't want to be critical of anyone else's salvation experience, but I cannot for one iota imagine Christ coming into my life and making the radical changes that he made, and, and I wasn't sure what day it was. Oh, I know. I see it like it's yesterday. I remember that run all the way home. It was a beautiful day in central Alabama in January, which is unusual. I remember kneeling on the little pew in that little country church on the very front with an appliance repairman named Ray Holly who went through the plan of salvation with me in God's word. It's never, ever been anything else in my life come close. So I'm telling you this morning that you can celebrate. If COVID was bad, you can celebrate. Listen, I had it twice. I had it bad twice. I celebrate. The hurricane was bad. My insurance company turned me down, denied me, went bankrupt. Then the state turned me down. So now I guess we're suing the state. What the heck? Sue somebody, right? <laughs> Amen. But the reality is, I could sit here and count all the bad things in my life this morning, but they don't come close to the celebration of what Christ has done in my life. You don't have to live in depression. You don't have to live in misery. You can live in life in Christ. So we're going to sing here in just a moment. Most important thing we're going to do today, and we're going to invite you to explore Jesus. Not to the church, to Jesus. To explore Jesus. And if you think you're finally ready to do that, We'd love to tell you how. We'd love to help you with that journey. Chance was baptized this morning. I celebrate with my brother. Listen, a lot of people come to Jesus in a moment and it's very real, but for Chance, it was a journey. He got an inquisitive mind. And his family goes, you have no clue. Yeah, I'm telling you, he got an inquisitive mind. It's okay. For God so loved the what? That's all of us. Let's pray together. Father, this morning I just love you and thank you for what you did for me on Calvary. God, I thank you that on January the 5th, 1975, you came into a teenage boy's heart and radically changed his heart and his life on the inside and you changed the direction of his world on the outside. Father, I ponder sometimes what could have been, and I'm so thankful that it wasn't a possibility that you changed it. And Lord, there's some here this morning who are living in great depression. There's some here this morning living in a miserable state of being. There's some here this morning who see no hope. Father, you tell us your hope. You tell us you're the answer. You're not only the way, the truth, and the life to heaven. You're the way, the truth, and the life for living right now. And so this morning as we sing, there are some here who've been right up to that line, maybe several times. And they want to trust you, but they can't stop trusting themselves. They want to commit to you, but they can't imagine you being in charge. Father, I pray today that you'll give them a peace. That if they'll trust you and come to you, it'll be all right. 
Life may still be hard, but they'll walk through it much better because you'll be with them every step of the way. And so, Father, for those who are convicted of their sins, the way they've lived, the way they have devalued what you did for them on the cross, I pray this morning your Holy Spirit has spoken to them and they know that it's time. That no matter what they've done, how bad they think it is, no matter how much the old devil's told them that you would never love them, let them know that's a lie. That you do love them more than they can imagine. And so, Father, in these moments, have your way with us. In Jesus' name, amen.